See, Paul, the greatest missionary to the Gentile world, struggles with this conflict. How do you bring the gospel to a pagan nation? Do you use philosophy and apologetics to, to come into conflict with it and to convince them that there's a different thing, different idea? Do you use science, the natural world, to just rationalize and prove that this God is real? So by the time Paul gets to his second missionary journey, he starts to understand this difference that he's facing. How do I bring this gospel against this gospel? And he's struggling, I think, in trying to grasp this. So we see him on his journey, on his second journey. He has just been through Cyprus um, and Antioch, and now is in Berea with Silas and Timothy. The Jews have an uprising because he's been preaching in Berea and didn't like the topic, what he was doing. And uh, Paul almost flees. Silas and Timothy stays behind. And now Paul is by himself, and he ends up in Athens. Athens is not your typical city. It is the intellectual center of the Roman world. Inside of Athens is the home of Plato's Academy, Aristotle's disciples, that is the main philosophy that is driven in Athens. Athens is also where the moral law of Rome is decided. This is where the laws are passed for morality. And the judges that do this sit on Mars Hill. They are in the Areopagus. I can never say the word. Areopagus. And that is where this supreme court of moral law sits. So Paul gets to Athens, and he first goes to the synagogue, and says, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well in the marketplace day to day with those who happened to be there. We don't know what Paul is saying to the, the, the people in the synagogue, but it seems like these Jews are doing something right because there's God-fearing Greeks already there, pre the message of Christ coming to them, they're already saying, hey, there's something to what these Jews are doing. Maybe we should listen. We don't understand what he's discussing here in the synagogue, but I think maybe he's saying, guys, look at all these idols. Are we interacting with this culture? Are we doing things to change it? Are we trying to get the message of this God out there? But he's, he's distressed in seeing this, so something's off with him. He's, he's not sure what's going on. He's talking with the Jews, and I think there's just, his spirit isn't at peace. After that, it says he goes to the marketplace, or the Agora, the, the main town center, and is debating with the philosophers. These guys are Aristotle's disciples. Study Aristotle's philosophies. It's very similar to the peace of Rome. A lot of the main points are, are lining up with that, and that's the foundation of it. And he's preaching Christ with the philosophers. Now, they're amazed at it, because he's saying that there has been a resurrection, to a philosopher at this time, that is it's, it's a concept that's really hard to grasp because their gods didn't really do resurrection. They came in and out of earth, but it wasn't really a death, burial, and resurrection. So they, they knew that this was, had to be a god. And they were amazed at what he was saying. So he was doing such a good job with this argument that they said, God, you're, you're, Paul, you're phenomenal here. I think that you need to go to the Areopagus and give... Your argument. That'd be like you downtown in Indianapolis, street preaching, and some guy comes up to you and says, man, that is such a fascinating argument. Um, I want you to come before the Supreme Court in D.C. next week. This is the highest intellectual center of the world, now before the judges that dictate the moral law of Rome. How would you feel if you had the opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ in the Supreme Court? MSNBC's cameras are rolling, CNN's there, BBC is there, Al Jazeera's there, everybody's there, and you got one chance to give the gospel. I see Paul walking in, he's got his new Armani suit on, he's got his Fifth Avenue Oxford shoes on, all polished, right? Maybe not. But he has one chance here. Read through his... Uh, sermon here. It's amazing what he does in his sermon. 
He uses, I think, about six different cultural references in his sermon. The first one is the, the altar of the unknown God. A lot of debate on what that was. They did find one in Pergamum that actually was an altar of an unknown God. So some of the, uh, the archaeologists think that possibly that was an altar where if a God did something in your life, but you couldn't quite figure out which one it was, you would do a sacrifice on the unknown God just saying, I recognize that a God did this, but I'm not sure who, who it was. That's one idea. Another one was it was just um, a God that they hadn't quite figured out yet. So there's a big debate on that, but he uses that to introduce us. Like, let me convince you about this other, this other God, and he uses that. He also uses the philosopher's words, some scholars say five times, where he uses their phrases in what he is saying. In him we live, move and have being. We are God's offspring. All of those are phrases right out of the current philosophy of that day. He uses about nine different examples of where he's interacting with their culture, but uses words and phrases out of the scriptures. He is ready to go. And he's on live TV, preaching the gospel. One of the examples that he uses is the Parthenon itself on the, on the Mars Hill. Was claimed to be the most beautiful crafted building ever built. And he says that God is building a temple not built with hands. And he's interacting with that culture and trying to fit in this new gospel of Jesus Christ using their culture. But I want us to recognize two things. In my New Testament, there's no first and second Athens. Paul gets done, and it says that, that a few believed. I think there was da uh, Damaris, the woman, uh, Dionysus, a member of the Areopagus himself, converted in a small group of believers, but we don't have reference of a church in Athens. Immediately following Athens, he heads to Corinth. 1 Corinthians 2, uh, um, says, so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I come to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. I find that interesting. Just after he stands in the Supreme Court of the land with the most eloquent and philosophical sermon, he's now marching to Corinth. In weakness, without human wisdom, without eloquence, and made a vow, it seems, that I'm only going to preach Jesus Christ and his resurrection. I think Paul realized that the first tactic in influencing our culture is not the Supreme Court. I think he realizes that God didn't want him to tell people who God is. That God wanted him to show the people who God is. When Jesus come, came to earth, he, he came to say basically that I want you to show you what God is and how to live your life. Be my disciple, be salt, be light. It also says that when he goes to Corinth, he picks the weak, the nobodies. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. What a contrast! In Paul's ministry, I actually think this is where he 
flips and becomes a disciple maker. After this, he has disciples and changes his ministry. Before this, he rarely stays more than six months at a place. After this, it's at least two years. He goes from the Areopagus and says, no, 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 let's start a church. Not with the mighty, but the weak. And this small church formed. And very soon, Corinth became the center of the Christian world. Instead of proclaiming in the philosopher's halls, he's now preaching along the streets, along the river, 